You're all set. Have a great meeting, everyone. Thank you, Athena. Thank you, Athena. Okay, so we have everyone we are expecting. So I am going to start the formalities here. Um, at 2.03 p.m. on September 29th, 2020, seeing a quorum of the Community Resources Committee present, I am calling this meeting to order. Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, MGL chapter 30A section 20, allows us to hold this virtual meeting of the CRC. This meeting is being recorded for future broadcast and all votes, if there are any, will be by roll call. At this time, I'm gonna call upon each committee member by name so that we can confirm you can hear me and we can hear you. Uh, after I've done that, please mute your mic as we move on. Um, let me get my list here. Steve Schreiber. Here. Evan Ross. Here. Mandy Jo Haneke is here. And Shalini Balmilm. I'm here. Excellent. And Sarah Swartz will not be attending today. Because uh, a giant vulture right behind Dave. I, and I don't think it's a vulture. I think it's just weird arms. No, it's really interesting. You know, when you move, it kind of. Yeah, there it is. It's right behind you. It's going to attack him soon. Um, I'm, I'm hoping there's no vultures flying over me right now. <laughs> At this time, we're going to go into general public comment. Um, public comment on matters within the jurisdiction of the Community Resources Committee is, a, is allowed at this time. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. Um, and we, CRC will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. To participate in public comment, we have no call in people. So if you want to make a public comment, please raise your hand and I will recognize you. No hands raised, we will move on in our meeting. Um, the next item up, we have three items on our discussion items for today. Each one will take, I'm hoping, well, we are allotting approximately um, 35 minutes for each of these items, because um, that is about equal time for everything. We'll see how it goes. Um, I'm not sure we'll get through every item in that 35 minutes, but that's what we're aiming for at this point to, to get the conversation started and see where we are. The first item on the agenda is the CRC policy on recommending appointments to the planning board and ZBA. Um, in the packet is the process that we adopted and also comments received from candidates. I solicited those comments uh, last week. I gave until Sunday night to respond. I received a few responses. Those are in the packet anonymized, um, as I had promised they would be anonymized. So um, I think we can start a discussion on if they're, what we think worked well, what we think might not be, and how maybe if there were things that didn't work well, we can improve the process. Any thoughts from individuals? Evan. Oops. So you, you know I'll always talk given a given a chance. Um, so yeah, so this was the first time CRC implemented this. And so having seen it run a couple times with OCA, I was obviously very interested to see um, whether sort of our um, one experiment in having the public meeting group interviews would work as it did with uh, planning board and zoning board under OCA, and two, to see uh, the utility of the statements of interest, which were something that were new. Um, I, I personally found, and I think we saw reflected in the comments, that uh, the decisions we made to hold group interviews, I think, continue to be a good decision. I know there was a lot of concerns when OCA first revealed that part of the process uh, about whether a group interview um, would make things harder for people. Um, 
But I think being able to do them all at once and be able to hear people's responses back to back was really useful. I think it also allowed people to build off each other. And I think we had at least two comments that said it sort of created a collegial atmosphere, um, which was something that actually when Oka was deciding to do group interviews, that was never one of our objectives and never discussed, but was pointed out to us after the first planning board interviews. Um, I want to say, I think we did a really good job with questions. We spent a long time coming up with interview questions. Um, and you never know how a question is going to go until you ask it. And I think certainly in the two OCA interview processes I went through, there were questions that afterwards we went, OK, that didn't really work. Um, I thought that all of our questions worked. I thought we got really unique responses um, to some of them that were really interesting and that were all different from just what we would have had on a CAF or what we had in the SOI. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say is that I found the statements of interest to be incredibly helpful, more useful than any CAF has ever been uh, through any of the three OCA rounds of um, appointments that I went through with that. Um, I found myself going back and reading them during the deliberation, especially when the deliberation got tough to, to inform and to complement the interview. So I think that using um, the statements of interest was a really useful thing that I hope we continue to do. At this point, I don't necessarily have anything that stood out to me as needing a change. I know that we got criticism from at least one counselor regarding our deliberation process. Um, I disagree with what was said, and I personally think that the way we went about our deliberation um, was thoughtful, and I think that we, um, we did a good job. Thank you, Evan. Uh, Shalini. Yeah, yes to everything that Evan said. And actually, unfortunately, it's too bad Sarah's not here because I actually wanted to touch back on a comment that she made at the council meeting and we obviously didn't discuss it there, but I think it's a very important question that she raised about the fact that the planning board is, I mean, the CRC is working really closely with the planning board and making recommendations to the council about important issues. And then the planning and the CRC is the appointing or not the appointing, but making the recommendations for the appointments. So just from my auditing background, you know, it was never a good idea, not even not a good idea. It was not good practice at all to have the single person or group be in charge of the full process from beginning to end so there are no checks and balances in that and i don't know what our everyone's thoughts were about that the fact that yeah Shalini. um steve yeah so um well, i mean obviously what's different is the you know so i read some of the letters in the gazette and what's different is that the residents now know who is applying for these kinds of positions. They never had that knowledge before. So, so that's, that's very different. And it may attract a different kind of person who's willing to step forward for these positions. And I think that, you know, unless we change the process, we'll have to live with that, that, that it's a very public process. Uh, I think that you may know one of my concerns is that it doesn't have to do with our own process, but it had to do with what followed ours is that what can and can't be considered. So I think that it, well, maybe it even goes back to our process. So we had really two things that we, three things that we could, well, two things that we could consider. One are the statements of interest. The other one is the interview. That's it, right? So really our decision should be based on those two things. So we shouldn't be introducing other things, including personal knowledge of the candidates, which I, and I, I think that I brought that in because I, um, I may have brought that in, issue in. So we might consider, do we want other information? And I guess I'm thinking specifically of letters. So if we think that letters are a good idea, like from one, two or three people, then we should all ask all candidates to have one, one, two or three letters of reference. And that should be what's considered. But I very much subjected to what happened after our recommendation, which was sort of random new information that was brought in. So we, we can't control what happens after us, but we certainly can control what happens 
on our process. And I, I think that I would be more comfortable if we had just a little bit more information, maybe triangulation from someone other than the candidate, him or herself, that says that this candidate is a, is a um, this is why this person's a good candidate for that particular position. Thank you, Steve. Um, any other thoughts at this point before I summarize what I've heard and then give some of my thoughts? Evan. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to respond to things that Shalini and Steve said. I know Shalini expressed what, what had been some concern about um, is too much vested in the CRC. Um, of course, the reason we put this in the CRC was because they were the body that was most familiar with the work of the planning board. Um, and I think I, I stand by that. If you remember actually early when we looked at restructuring, the very first proposal put all appointments in GOL. Um, and one of the reasons that appointments for planning board and ZBA were moved to CRC is because we, in theory, would be the members most knowledgeable about the proceedings. And I, um, and I think that's still useful. Um, and I found that having um, that knowledge and, you know, to some extent for me being forced to forced um, feeling a responsibility of going to more planning board meetings and going to the public hearings as a member of the CRC, I think gave me even better background of the operations of the planning boards and the deliberations that I didn't necessarily have as a member of OCA. And I think that helped make my decision. So I understand the concern, but I'm, I'm not sure I, I, um, I share that concern. Uh, with regard to um, Steve's idea of more information, one place that we did not get information um, and we only ever have once before was from planning staff. Um, and that's, that's sort of an interesting one that I, I wanted to just touch on. The very, very first um, round of appointments that the council made in spring 2019, um, when OCA had the process that was later uh, panned by the entire council. Um, part of that was that there was an, inter an unofficial interview team that conducted those interviews that consisted of the OCA designee, the town manager, and then um, the staff liaison or whatever staff member is most closely associated with that committee. And so for planning board, um, in the spring, I believe Chris Brestrup sat in on all of those interviews, and then she was able to provide input to the OCA designee, who at the time was Sarah Swartz, on what she thought of each candidate from the perspective of a staff member. And Sarah said later during OCA conversations that she thought that that was very useful. The problem, of course, is that was all able to be a private conversation because it was just Sarah. And I would be uncomfortable putting our staff on the spot of having to give their personal opinions on individual candidates, especially candidates up for reappointment um, in a public meeting. I think that that puts staff in a really uncomfortable position that I wouldn't be willing to put them in. But I do think that when Steve's talking about sort of what other information, that's actually a piece of information that would be very useful. Um, and it's sort of unfortunate that we don't necessarily have a way to get that information. But we had we did have it in the past and Sarah did say that it was really useful to have um, Chris Brestrup's input when, when doing those first rounds of interviews. Thank you. Um, I'm not hearing a lot of requests or any requests to change any of the current process. Um, so if I have missed that, in my hearing of what people have said, please let me know. I did, I, I wanted to say two things. Number one, um, when we were doing the deliberations, it came up um, some questions about, well, do any of the candidates, would any of the candidates accept less than a three-year term if we're not doing three-year terms or, you know, we, we had advertised for three-year terms and all. And so I, won, I, I was thinking it might be good not to add a question but as we go into a process next year to um, make a note somewhere for the chair as the chair or the person who's doing all the communicating with the candidates, either we add a question during an interview or we add some basic question to a statement of interest or we have the person doing the communication reach out to all the candidates and say, hey, we might not 
a point for a full three year term anyone you know some some terms we might be doing a vacancy so it might not be a three year term but to reach out and say are you are you willing to serve less than three years you know as just a blanket sort of standard question somewhere whether that be done through email or during the interview process i don't know but it came up a couple of times over the last couple of months in terms of are people willing, are they not? And no one had asked the question. And so I think we should make a note of that somewhere and decide where maybe a question like that is appropriate during the process, uh, especially if, uh, especially if since these are all advertised as three-year terms, if we're looking to fill a off cycle vacancy, say, um, due to either a resignation, essentially due to a resignation um, where it's likely not to be a three year term to make that clear. Um, so that was one observation I had. Um, and then the other one doesn't necessarily relate to our process, although it sort of does, it goes back to the one item in our process that was changed significantly from the OCA process that was forwarded to us, which was the term limit section. Um, that was removed term, the words term limits have been removed from it. We reworded it um, and the letters that Steve and all were referring to and a lot of the comments that we've received during this process related to whether a person, what that standard is for someone seeking essentially a reappointment. Um, I, I say I don't think it necessarily relates to our process particularly because what people are referring to is a document that the town council has never adopted, um, which is the appointed committee handbook in general. And the council as a whole has never adopted that or adopted any type of regulations or any standard regarding term limits or term appointments or anything like that. Um, so my question, I guess, for the committee would be, is this something that we as a committee believe um, should be brought forward to the council for a full discussion on that item, not just as it relates to planning board and ZBA, um, but as it relates to all, I think we do at least three appointments, finance, planning board, and ZBA, um, because it comes up in all three. Um, and so, like I said, I don't think it's something we as a CRC should have have any authority to make a decision on but the question is do we want to make a recommendation to the council for the council to discuss something like that steve so the words originalist and textualist and <laughs> legislating from the bench have all been very much in the news in the last couple of days um but i feel that we shouldn't alter you know i, I feel that we shouldn't try to alter by policy what said either in the charter and or the zoning bylaw, which I believe state that the term is three years, so that the planning board terms are three years. So that's all it says. And so I don't think we should, if we wanna change that to, you know, say that really it's six years, but at three years you get a review and you might be kicked off, which is what some people were implying, or, you know, it's six years and we mean six years, then we should, advocate for the bylaws to change to reflect that. But I, I, I feel very uncomfortable trying to give any other direction other than what's given in the actual laws that are written, either through the zoning bylaw or through the charter. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Shalini. So this is not in response to your question though. So should we, I just wanted to give everyone time to. Continue on and we'll, it's kind of a free flowing conversation. So I'm sure if people have a response, they'll get back to it eventually. Okay. Yeah, I'm still thinking about that one. Also still thinking about the question that I had, like just to put a closure to that, I do appreciate Evan's perspective on that, that the reason why CRC is the authority to appoint the people is because we know the issues the closest. And, and that is the reason why in the first place I had supported that. But now that we are getting more involved with the 
changes in zoning and a lot of the important issues, can someone just articulate? Like, how are we explaining that? Not only, it's not like a justification thing, but I'm just thinking long-term, they're gonna be different people. I really trust the integrity of everyone in this group and our intentions, but just moving forward, you're gonna have different people. And, and so we're just saying that the people who are gonna appoint the planning board are the people who are going to also be part of, let's say, zoning change, make proposed zoning changes and whatnot? And is that a conflict? Not conflict of interest, but it's like it's the same people who propose zoning change, the same people who are going to say we want these people. Of course, the town council in the end makes the final choice. So there is that. But I just want to make sure that we all can say what makes this okay because in auditing from an auditing lens it does not it's not okay to do that but i know this is not an auditing situation so can someone just articulate that and so that we're all on the same page and then as far as we speak to residents and what we're saying is the same thing then evan i was going to comment on something else so if steve wanted to respond mm -hmm. i'll respond to that but i'd rather have steve go first since he had his hand up Steve? Yeah, I, I literally don't think we can overthink this. We're advisory. So what we're doing is we're presenting us, we're like a nominating committee. So we're presenting a slate to the full town council. The full town council makes the decision. Of course we have, I mean, we're, we are this body because we are trying to advance certain issues in the town that we think are important. And of course, we would like to select a slate that will help advance, you know, issues that we think that are important. That's what our job is. And that's what, how the, you know, the charter is written that the town council selects the, the planning board, the town council selects the zoning board of appeals. That was made in part for that reason that, so that, um, mm. so that, um, I, I'm not sure how to explain it, but the, and we as a body of 13 can make a decision. Do we, do we want the team of rivals? Do we want the, you, you know, how exactly do we see that team being formed? But I don't see there to be a conflict of interest for the reason that we're only advisory. We're a nominated committee. Evan. Yeah, so again, I, I would just go back to my original point on this, which is to say, you know, I think that Oka did a great job in, in um, doing these appointments. However, I do think that the conversations in this committee looked very different from the conversations in Oka. And I think part of that was born of the fact that we had greater knowledge of what was going on in the planning board at the time, what they were tackling, what was upcoming, what their deliberations had looked like. And I think that gave us a better idea of what the needs of the planning board mm -hmm. were at that time. OCA had members on it who had never been to a planning board hearing before who were helping to select someone to serve on the planning board. And I think that what that meant was that when we were thinking about the needs of the planning board, we were entirely reliant on what the chair said. So the process has always involved input from the chair. We did that again. What I think was different was because this body had sat in on, had participated in joint hearings, had followed the planning board, had a relationship with the planning board. Um, we also had our own uh, view or perspective of how the planning board operated and what makes it effective and what it needed. Whereas OCA didn't have that, didn't have that sort of background knowledge. And so when it came to what does the planning board need, it was entirely dependent on the word of the chair. And to be honest, that, that got controversial at times um, because at least one member of OCA disagreed a lot with what the chair said and wanted to you know, strike from consideration certain things that the chair said. I think that the ability that this committee said, look, you know, Steve was talking about different information we have. I think we have input from the chair, we have the SOIs, we have the interviews, but then 
as the body that works with the planning board, we also have our own experiences with the planning board. And I think that makes for a more informed decision um, and, and can he help, the, help put forth appointments um, that really fit in the needs of the planning board at that moment based on what they are tackling um, at that time or in the foreseeable future, which a different committee just might not be aware of. I, but I was also originally had raised my hand for Mandy's question, I'm realizing. Yep. <laughs> um, I, I would dread a conversation in the council about terms and term limits. And I, and I say that because I went through that conversation in OCA and it was a difficult conversation and it was a long conversation. That said, um, this has been a recurring issue every time we've had appointments. And I think there's some concern that, you know, OCA came to some consensus around appointment, reappointment, term limits, all of that after a grueling debate. And then it came here and this committee changed it. And then in January, the president may change out this committee membership and then we might change it again. And I think that that's caused, that's caused some concern among counselors on the council. Um, and I think partly because the decision of how the council treats appointment and reappointment doesn't necessarily belong to any individual committee. Um, so there are a lot of reasons why we would come up with interview questions, why we would come up with selection guidance. Making the decision on having individual committees come up with a decision on the policy of the council regarding reappointment, I do think is a bit of a stretch. And, and I've actually always thought that. And when I first became chair of OCA, I had this vision of um, creating a town council appointment handbook that would be adopted much like our current appointment handbook, which has never been adopted and some of which is not relevant to the council because it's really an appointment handbook that's meant for the town manager. Um, we never got to that. And I, I also, you know, OCA wanted to maintain the um, independence and autonomy of committees. And so um, was, was, was very clear that the process was the OCA process. But I, I, as much as I don't want to have that debate, I do think if we had an adopted council policy regarding reappointment, and it might be what Steve said, it might be, look, the, the charter says three year terms. And so that's that you don't, that doesn't mean de facto six years, you get a reappointment. It could be that, but I think if the council itself had a policy that would cut down the debate that any committee is going to have every time there's an appointment about um the process and you know it's, it's just caused so much concern and questions that to some extent as much as I, I i hate to have that debate in the among 13 people it might just be nice to have it as sort of settled policy so that we can move on from it steve so we're basically asked to engage in what would be called a qualifications based selection process so our job is to recommend who we think is the most qualified. So some qualified um, qualification based selection processes like the selection of architects give weight for experience. So if you've done, if you have experience doing this before you're given 10 points or whatever it is that nobody else is given 10 points for. Um, if we were to give points for experience, that would be the only qualification now that we're giving extra points for. So if we're gonna do that, then I would say that we don't do that unless we also give points for everything else, you know, your education, your other, your other kinds of experiences. Um, so experience on the planning board or zoning board of appeals, five points, other experiences, five points, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But giving weight to that particular qualification in a qualification based selection process to me seems odd. And I would highly not recommend that because it's not going to get you the best outcomes.
Any other thoughts? So what I'm hearing is it's a possibility that maybe we should ask the council to take up at some point in time well before the next sort of round of appointments next May, June, July, April, May, June, um, the an issue regarding a policy surrounding reappointments. Um, but we're not that that's only a possibility at this point. I'm, and this is not on for a vote and we don't have five members here. So um, and it would not be specific to planning board or ZBA because there's also finance. Um, but I'm also not hearing any need to revisit any particular policy in the policy we've adopted for recommending appointments at this time. Um, Shalini. Just that one clarifying question about the process uh, where it says input from the body's chair and uh, we, the chair, the CRC chair will get this information from the chair of the planning board about skills and characteristics of a successful member, knowledge, expertise related, and then preferred knowledge to meet the current needs of that body. So I think that was what was really important in my decision making this time, which was like what is needed right now, like what's missing in the planning board and what is, um, and so is that information, was that information made public what the chair of the planning board had stated? Because I wonder if a lot of awkwardness could be avoided. That was made public? Yes, it, it was part of the document that was sent to all candidates on selection guidance. It was part of the selection right. guidance document that we voted to send to everyone. And it was also then published in the packet and given to the whole council. Right. Okay. But I don't remember any, I guess that was not seen as a <laughs> important skill, but I kept thinking that we need someone with a business perspective, but that was not something that came from the chair, I guess. I was just trying to think like, what would make it less awkward? You know, like as someone mentioned, the, one of the candidates, I think mentioned the awkwardness of the discussion about, you know, in front of them. And I was wondering if, if everyone just kept the focus on what, it wasn't about an existing member versus new or any of that. It, none of that should be relevant. What's really important is what is needed right now, especially given the current environment that we're working in. It so it turns out right now we are working in an environment where economic, crisis and social crisis is on top of everything else. And so we are working within that, um, within those constraints and within those constraints, looking at what skill sets do we are missing in our current planning board for them to be effective and all the discussion, if it was just, I think it was pretty much around that. We kind of avoided naming individuals or anything. The only th place where I think it got more individual was concerning, mis you know, someone who was already there. And so it was like, oh, why are we, but it wasn't about that. It was more about what's needed. So I was just wondering if there's a way to make that more clear that these are the skill sets we are looking for, but maybe that's already clear. So then never mind. I think we're both trying to lower your hand at the same time, Shalini. <laughs> I got it. I got it. <laughs> yeah, we were both clicking it at the same time. Uh, so I think the next steps on this one are um, to potentially next meeting, um, depending on agenda, put on the action items portion a discussion as to whether we do want to actually recommend um, or ask the council to take up the issue of reappointments and a policy surrounding reappointments to bodies that the council appoints. Um, but we're not going to finish that now. I will make a note in the agenda um, that that could be a next item, an action item for next meeting. 
Um, beyond that, I think we've we've covered what we're looking at, and we will not put this back on an agenda, and um, because we're we're happy with the process as it as it happened. Um, so with that, we move on, and we are ahead of schedule, which. <laughs> We might be able to have some time, longer time on one of these. The next item is zoning bylaw priorities. Um, and for this item, we, we need to, we had a good meeting last meeting on zoning bylaw priorities. Mm -hmm. We heard from the planning department. We heard from the planning board um, what they voted. We heard from a number of counselors at the meeting itself and also through emails and all. I have updated that document. And um, I updated that document in two ways. I attempted to add everything that this committee members had said at the meeting in terms of their priorities. I'm not sure I did it well. I tried um, based on my notes. Um, so please, if, if you know, obviously it's a compiled document that doesn't identify people, but if you think something's missing, um, let me know. Mm -hmm. But I also then added sort of an executive summary to it mm -hmm. because it's a long document. And what I went through is, I went through the groups of responses from the counselors, and I think that document includes responses from 10 counselors. Um, and I, I looked at each, and then I tallied how many counselors mentioned certain things. Um, and that's part of the executive summary in terms of when things, how often something came up from a counselor. Um, and I did that because I thought it might help us in our discussion. Um, in terms of as we move forward with trying to recommend priorities. Um, so I think today's discussion on this item should be based on what we heard, uh, should be focused on what I'd like to focus on is figuring out our ne next steps on this. Do we believe our next steps that we've got enough information to make a recommendation to the council on priorities or do we need more information? Who do we need that information from? what do we do about um, and how, how do we get in, in input um, from the community on priorities um, and, and things like that. So I, I, more of a process discussion um, going forward to, to understand how we're going to make a recommendation to the council instead of sort of starting to drill down to make that recommendation. Um, that's the port part of the discussion we didn't really get to last meeting is what the next steps are in making a recommendation um, and what we need to do to get there. So thoughts on um, what our next steps are in getting to helping, you know, making a recommendation to the council in order to help guide the planning department as it moves forward on what it's already looking at, but also maybe what it's not looking at that the council might want it to look at. Evan. I actually just had a question first. Um, it, the, the document says from uh, 10 counselors. Um, we had been told last time CRC counselors hold off on sending because it, we, would, we would be able to discuss them. Um, I guess my question is I, I know that at least Shalini and me and maybe Sarah, I'm trying to remember, um, offered comments and priorities. I, I know I never sent mine in. I don't know if mm. other members of this committee did. So I guess I, I'm just curious, does this, does that, that 10 necessarily includes members of this committee? But I, I guess I, I don't know if what I said during the meeting or what Shalini said during the meeting are included in this or not. I attempted to include them in this document. Um, that doesn't mean I did a I, it, it means it was based on my notes, not based on mm. how you, how the individual counselors would have written them. Okay. That that was my, yep, that makes sense. That was my question. So, Steve. Yeah, well, actually, it's a really amazing job you've done in helping try to organize it. So mm. I keep thinking of trying to put the rocks in the pail. So you've got mm -hmm. a bunch of rocks that you need to put in a pail. So do you start with the little rocks or do you start mm -hmm. with the big rocks? 
So if we start with the big mm-hmm. rocks, then mm-hmm. we can get more rocks in the pail, but then mm-hmm. we might have a harder time getting get into the little rocks, which are actually also important. So I see a lot of things that like seem to be a, an asterisk or a footnote, and those footnotes and asterisks have big meanings to them. But there, there seem to be a, like a, some little things that we could take care of if we all agreed on that. But then there are some big macro things like, what do we want downtown you know, to look like and how do we get there? And in a way, those are the most critical. And those are probably the things that we all campaigned on, right? Mm-hmm. So I think we probably, all of us, all 13 of us, talked about the look and feel of downtown as an issue that we wanted to, to address during our three years in office. So I guess I'll put that on the table that if we go back and look at what we said mm-hmm. as we were campaigning two years ago, maybe that should help us figure out what the priorities might be. Yeah, I was approaching this. Yeah, and again, really appreciate you, Mandy Joe, for it's a lot of work putting all that and then figuring out the executive summary was really helpful. I will definitely look at it again to make sure that all my points are reflected and send them to you if they're not. Um, but as I started to look at it, I was thinking more from the perspective of the town manager's goal. I was seeing like as a council, what are our goals and the closest we can come to that is what we have for the town manager's goals. And out of those, the economic vitality and the housing, um, issue, affordable and mixed income housing seem to be the two most closely related to planning board work. So I was I started making a table with those two as the goals and what were the suggestions from the town councilors that fit related to economic vitality. And then I made if planning department and planning board, what were their recommendations with respect to economic vitality and housing. And so we just put all of those together and see which ones had the most common, like which the planning board also is recommending, the department's also recommending and the council also, you know, most council members also talked about it with respect to one of these two goals, to me, that seems a very uh, logical place to start. And so, for example, I think if you look at economic vitality, we definitely have um, comments from planning department and our council, at least, and actually planning board haven't yet filled in, but about the downtown um, and how to <clears throat> revitalize that. Um, so, you know, that's just an example, but we can see that across the board, that was something that was stated at every level. So we could start with the broader things like that, but then see within that, what is implemental, speaking to what Steve is saying, within the broader thing, what are some immediate things that can be corrected or rectified based on our feedback from town staff, that this is what they're hearing from people, whether it's resi- all the stakeholders, including residents, including um, businesses. Um, and I don't mean just the big developers when I say businesses, I mean the development, of course, in terms of housing and all of that, but also um, in terms of the businesses, what are we hearing? And last time I didn't share this example, but I've spoken a lot. So I'll give my, my voice a break <laughs> and I'll come back and share the example because someone was like, what does small business have to do with planning board decisions and zoning decisions? So I wanted to give an example for that. Uh, Evan. Yeah, so this is a, already a very interesting conversation um, because you're right, we have this very long document that you did a great job summarizing. And then we have to say, so now what do we do with this? And and what even is our role? Are we giving to planning staff a directive of these are the things you have to work on? Is it our, here's our priorities? But I mean, th- there's a lot to sort of, uh, a lot of nuance here to figure out. Um, but one of the things that I first approached was, I, you know, and I've been talking a lot about, um, needing to um, really prioritize uh, planning department staff as really the main um, 
force for, for changes. There's been a lot of conversation of should these things come from the council? Should they come from the planning board? And I think my argument has long been that really uh, I'd like to see them come from planning staff. And so I, I went actually first to the document you put together of notes on planning department presentation, because that was most important to me. And, and what stood out to me was um, the demolition delay bylaw, because that was identified as Rob Mora as problematic. Um, and we know it's already in process of being revised. And in fact, your note is with it almost complete. I, I don't know if that means like in the next month or in the next six months, but you know, if it's, if it's almost there, that makes sense. Uh, the flood maps, because that's something, and um, the new section to, to do that, because that's going to be something that we need to do. And then the other thing that stood out was the sign bylaw, because it's been incredibly hard to enforce and um, possibly unconstitutional. Um, you know, in fact, you all remember that when we did the general bylaw um, repeal and replace from the uh, bylaw review committee, we actually just stripped the signed bylaw out completely and just reserved a section for a rewritten signed bylaw um, because it was determined by that committee and especially by um, Bob Ritchie, who has a lot of experience in this, that there is no way it would have passed um, legal muster. So those were the three that jumped out as like, oh, we should really do these. And then I went over to the town councilor list and realized that none of those three were in the council list because they're sort of the unsexy zoning things that really need to be done. But no, you know, Steve said, what did we run on? No, no counselor ran on the sign bylaw. I mean, listen, did, but probably no counselor ran on the sign bylaw, right? No counselor ran on updated flood maps, but they're sort of the things we need to do. And so that's where I'm finding sort of a struggle here is some of the stuff that, in my opinion, probably should be priorities are not the big rocks that Steve identified that are the things that I know that the council is passionate about and finding a way to balance like the necessary, because all this, you know, our planning department only has so much capacity, right? And so the sign bylaw itself is will be a, a, a big undertaking. And I think a note in there even said possibly needs consultant support. Um, so just those things alone are going to take time, but no one on the council wants to deal with those, right? Because they're not the fun stuff, fun. Um, and so that's where I'm having a little bit of trouble is if I was to give initial priorities, I'd say demo delay and sign bylaw. And yet those aren't the things that we saw that our colleagues on the council really want us to prioritize. Um, so I think finding that balance is gonna be difficult. I do like, I did like that you tried to tally the numbers. And so I guess, you know, to some extent, the top two that have seven, which is a majority of the council, makes sense to also consider as priorities, recognizing, of course, that there might be disagreement within some of those. Um, so this is, this is tough, but I, I do want to make sure that we're um, looking at planning staff's um, priorities. And to me, I'm sort of hiding those, holding those up above um, even though they're not necessarily the stuff that our, our colleagues said that they're interested in. Steve. Yeah, so I don't see 40R mentioned as a priority, and it may be that I searched wrong. But um, so 40R is a very sort of advanced idea that is working its way th through the planning, at least the planning process. And in a way, 40R also covers a lot of the issues that are being talked about from form-based code to affordable housing, to the look and feel of downtown, you know, to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But I would think that would be, and I think that that was on the planning board. And I, I don't have the planning board list in front of me, but somehow I think that was on their list. I'm not sure. But that would be something that I would think that we could get our arms around and because it really does check a lot of the boxes that are on this list of uh, things that counselors are concerned about. So just to answer your question, Steve, the three um, items on the planning board list were improve downtown zoning and unlock housing development and increase diversity of housing stock and the recodification of the zoning bylaw. So they didn't mention 40R by name either then. Okay. But, 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 I mean, that's really what 40R is intended to do is some of the things that you just mentioned. And it can, it can uh, 
settle the issue of inclusionary zoning and the height of buildings and things like that. So, so that, that's really what the 40R proposal, as I last saw it, is trying to do. Um, Shalini and then Dave. Would Dave like to go first? I just want to hear what he has to say first. That's fine, Dave. Um, yeah, no, I, I just wanted to comment on, where are we here, on 40R, can you hear me? Um, yeah, I think it'd be important to hear from Chris Prestrup in particular on 40R. I, I hear what Steve is saying is that the intention is that 40R can do a lot of things. I think there's, there's question among planning staff as to whether how effective it will be in our in our downtown in particular. So not to say it's it's not a tool that we could use, but I'm not really sure um, it it falls in the top five priorities for planning staff. But I think it'd be worth you know in a future meeting having Chris talk a little bit about that. But I I just wanted to add this is a great conversation and um, I appreciate you all having it. So thank you, Dave Shawnee. Yeah, I, I see the CRC as being the central hub in some sense, like we're listening to the planning staff, uh, staff and the council and the planning board and, you know, kind of keeping this conversation going. And I appreciate what Evan said. We do want to pay attention to the planning staff because they have the most um, experience as we <laughs> identified. None of us even thought of what they thought of because they're dealing with that and they know it. And that being said, I do feel like we're under very different circumstances right now. As we all know, I don't have to remind anyone, but I think we really do need to look at what is most critical right now to support our existing businesses and housing needs. And what are some zoning issues that you know, changing that will send a message out to them that, hey, they are we're going to work with you in this time. And, and so, and that's why, okay, I'll give the example now because I think it makes sense to show that connection between um, zoning and small businesses, and especially small doctor's offices or lawyers and how that's connected. So I received this email from a local professional who said that as an example, um, I, uh, the problem is that PRP, the Professional and Research Park Zoning, so this person's office is obviously in a PRP zoning, are so restrictive that unless you plan to have a small research lab, you have to go through the site plan review, which cost me tens of thousands last time, as multiple meetings with engineers, lawyers, architects, etc. It is all designed with the image of a rich corporation who can afford such bureaucracy. Meanwhile, the person who bought the land, which contains a residence, isn't allowed to build residential units on it either because it's PRP, so this plot of land can't really be used by either of us. Okay, now that I'm reading this, I feel like I've read this example before. <laughs> but anyway, that kind of ties into the idea that this is a local professional who is struggling and has paid thousands of dollars and the time lost thousands of dollars of revenue because we took so long to allow this person to start operation. And so our research park zoning is something perhaps that, need, I mean, it's just, I, I don't know what the answer is, but my point is what are some of the zonings that need? And the other one I heard when I spoke to uh, a person who understands urban planning and her perspective from that list, I can tell you. Oh yeah, the, the fact that we have, we need downtown is one of the only business general zones, which is again, very limiting. So, I mean, if you look at the map, zoning map and only downtown is business general, it looks like, and maybe a few small areas other than that, which again, makes it really hard for businesses to have residents and business at the same place. So 
those are my examples of where zoning might be limiting. As it is, we have limited land for development and business use because we want the conservation and that's an asset. We don't want to disturb that. We don't want to change that. We want to keep our residentials with this extensive spaces, but we need to figure out where we can allow for more business general to happen. So I'm going to take, before I recognize Dave, I'm going to take my, my <laughs> turn. Um, something that struck Evan is also what struck me. The items that the planning department staff identified as coming up and priority, priorities in terms of the substantive manner are almost not congruent with what the council identified or even what the planning board identified. I mean, the recodification was there. Um, some of it's sort of there, the, um, the apartment mixed use type things that the planning staff, um, you know, talked about the inclusionary zoning, mixed use conundrum as the you know, in need for housing and increased density and in footnote A. Um, but in general, what the council seemed to want to work on was not necessarily the same as what the planning staff wanted to work on and similarly with the planning board of the unlock housing um, and work on downtown. So I struggle with again and how to balance those and I think that's what might be our role as CRC in trying to give some guidance or make a recommendation to the council that would then give guidance to the planning staff is okay of what you think is important and what we think are important, how do we meld them? And how do we think we should meld them in a way that in say the next year, we can get some real stuff accomplished, both what might not be on the radar of the council, things like the flood maps that are gonna be mandatory need to be done um, and stuff that, you know, other co committees and commissions that have been working hard on get done. Um, but also how do we bring in something like form-based zoning that, a majority of the council mentioned in some manner design guidelines, form-based zoning for various parts of towns. How do we put a focus on that again um, and all? Um, so I think that's what we have to figure out here is that. And the question I have for the committee is, are we ready to start figuring that out to make a recommendation or do we need to speak with more people and go out and have more forums or meetings before we can get to that recommendation would be a question I have for the whole committee. Um, that's it for now, Dave. But yeah, again, this is a great conversation. Um, and I really appreciate Evan pointing out, you know, the, the, the staff list, that piece about demo delay, flood map, sign by law. These are things that staff have been working with the planning board and uh, in the case of the demo delay with the historical commission for quite some time. And each one I think is at a, a, in a state of readiness. They're a little bit different and the, the timeline for each one is, is a little bit different. But I do think it's very important and instructive to, to note that they're really, you know, they're, there's really not much overlap between what the council said or their prior, your priorities and um, and having those done. I think, again, this would be a great conversation to have with Rob and, and um, Chris at your next meeting about, so are there ways to move those forward without, you know, uh, we, you know, without taking too much bandwidth from the CRC and the council? In other words, flood mapping has to, it's been moving forward. It, it is just going to move forward. It doesn't, I don't think that necessarily has to be a mammoth lift or, or take a tremendous amount of your bandwidth or staff bandwidth. I think signed bylaw is a bigger lift. Um, demo delay, um, I'm of the mind that it doesn't have to be that big of a lift, but I could be a little bit wrong on that. We, we, we certainly will have some uh, spirited discussion about that um, in the community. Um, but I, I think I wanted to go back to, um, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought here a little bit. Um, just, oh, you know, if we were having this conversation nine months ago, 10 months ago, I think it would be completely different. And I go back to what Shalini said a few minutes ago. I think we all have to fully recognize that um, the world changed, uh, the country changed, uh, the state changed, Amherst changed, and it's 
but it's going to change more, unfortunately, in a way that uh, we all are going to be, uh, we're going to struggle with and we're going to be shocked by when more and more businesses go out of, go out of business. So I think as you look at that list, I think it's imperative that you and the planning staff and all staff who are going to be involved in this really look at this with a COVID lens and say, what are the things that can best position Amherst when, uh, to, to help us come out of uh, this pandemic? So I think, you know, looking at downtown is critical. It is the core of our commerce, our retail, our restaurants, and looking at village center zoning. So. I know you know that, but I just wanted to insert that again, that I think this seven page list, we need to really look at it with kind of a COVID lens and make sure that that those things that we are gonna work on in the next year are gonna help us be positioned to, to as Shalini said, help those businesses that survived the pandemic or new ones that might come in that say, hey, there's, you know, Sadly, there'll be space available. There'll be retail space. There'll be commercial space available. And we want to make sure we're poised to accept and welcome them here and help them to be as successful as possible. So I hope that doesn't sound preachy. I know you know that, but I just, I'm feeling that every day in the work we're doing here in town hall. So um, appreciate it. Thank you, David. Um, Evan. Yeah, so first, thanks, Dave, because I, uh, Agree. Um, so I guess um, your question is, what's the next step? And do we feel like we have the information we need? Um, I feel like we have the um, ideas and suggestions we need. I I'm not looking for, um, I think we have more than enough on this list of potential changes. Um, I guess what I, what I would be interested in doing um, relates to exactly what Dave said uh, in the first part of his comment, which is hearing sort of a timelines for some of these things. Because um, I guess I'm thinking, you know, Steve went, going back to Steve, I really like Steve's big rocks, small rocks um, metaphor. And I'm thinking some of the small rocks will are easy to do and have a big impact. And some of the big rocks will have a big impact, but take a big period of time. And it, I think that's useful information for us to know. And so for instance, off the top of my head, if we're combining impact, time, and um, COVID lens, to me, fixing the BL district is like the number one priority. Because to some extent, the solution to fixing the BL, I mean, this is my personal opinion, but the solution to fixing the BL district is either rezoning BL as BG or just adding the BL to the footnote B. You don't need consultants for that. You don't need to, to take any time. I could write that bylaw by the end of this meeting, right? I mean, you, it's literally that simple and it completely unlock, it completely transforms the potential of the BL as a district for housing for economic development. And so that's useful to know, right? That the, the BL will take no real time to actually draft a revision to the bylaw. We already know what needs to be done. We just have to agree, is it option A or option B? Um, and it can have a huge impact. Whereas like inclusionary zoning, while it can have a huge impact, we know that that's not even something that likely our planning department staff is gonna write if we're gonna to look to re redo our inclusionary zoning, that's gonna to need to go to a consultant. That's gonna be, a, that, that won't even be done in the remainder of our term of office, right? And so I think knowing that helps because in, to some extent we can say, here are our three month priorities, here are our six month priorities, and here's our one year priorities. Because I literally do think like fixing the BL like I said, that could be introduced to the planning board within the next couple of weeks if we had, because we already know what needs to happen, right? Like you, we don't need to do more research. We don't need to hire a consultant. That's easy and it will have a huge impact. So I think maybe having um, Chris and Rob just to say, here's sort of the priorities. Where do you say are the like, we could bang these out really quickly and where are the ones that are gonna take a lot more staff time and where are the ones that you're gonna say, you know what, we really need a higher consultant for this. We need to allocate money because that'll give us a better idea of timelines and then we might be able to prioritize by impact versus time um, instead of saying, cause you know, like I said, looking at the BL, it's only four counselors, 
but form-based code is going to take a long time and probably a consultant to do, whereas the BL could be done, again, literally next month could be introduced to the planning board for consideration. Melanie. Yeah, I think I agree with what Dave suggested and what Evan is saying is inviting the planning staff and running by what they propose and what's coming up here and asking, you know, kind of having the back and forth in terms of impact, timing, and cost. I think when you say consultants will be needed, I think if we could break down things of what is going to have the most impact within the COVID, using the COVID lens, especially using the COVID lens, what's going to have the most impact um, for our businesses, for our housing needs, and and then what is the timing related to each and what is the cost going to be like, which one's going to require a consultant. And I think that will help us to then also work with them to figure out the priorities. Steve. My students, I, I teach a junior level architecture studio and we often choose sites in downtown Amherst as case studies. So so uh, last year we used the Bertucci, well, the La Porta site. And then this year we're, we're working on the Primo Pizza, um, whatever those, you know, Bresnahan Insurance block that's owned by, the, you know, the Brown family realty. And that's BL zone. So it is really jarring that on one side of the street, you have, you know, a certain amount of ambition on the other side of the street, you have much less ambition in terms of everything, creating a street, you know, creating a streetscape, creating um, more housing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the BL zone, our particular BL zone is in the, the you know, that we don't run that, there's no requirement for parking on that site, but then the amount of, you know, basically housing you can put on the site is very limited. So I, I did read something that Evan had written about all of that, and I found that really interesting. I didn't go back and look at the town meeting because the town meeting, this came up at town meeting, I think it was basically to change BL to BG, and that failed, but, and it was uh, you know, quite a vigorous failure, but I, I think that it's definitely worth discussing. So I'm not sure I'm ready to take all of, I, I actually agree with, I'm sort of agreeing with Evan that the BL, because there are so few parcels that are BL, that it's worth, it kind, it kind of is something that we could really work on, sort of unlock those. Um, and that would really help change the look and feel of downtown. So we need to make sure that that look and feel is, you know, consistent with what, where we are right now. Um, I think there's some flaws in BG that would have to be addressed if we were to do that. So I'm not so sure it's just a matter of changing BL to, to basically to BG, but the flaws in BG would also have to be addressed. But I'm seconding the motion that that would be a very interesting and um, manageable kind of task that would also address a number of the things on the list. So what I'm hearing is we might have enough information to do something, but we do want to be able to compare timing, impact, COVID lens, that type of thing in order to make a recommendation. Um, in the next five or six minutes, so next meeting, Dave and I will work together to figure out how we can get Rob and Chris in with that. I will take the in order to give them a heads up for some of this discussion, I would take the items that they obviously presented last meeting, but also the list in the executive summary where there were at least three counselors in the priorities so that they have something to start with and plan for and think about in terms of timing and impact um, to, to help them frame a discussion and us frame a discussion so it's a better discussion. Um, and, and the planning board priorities, those three sort of lists together. Um, my next question for the committee is when we get there, what, I guess, what goal are we aiming for in terms of what's our end game in this discussion? Is it really a recommendation to the council on here's what we ask the council to adopt as priorities? Um, as Evan said, is it a, a 
adoption by the councils? You know, is it a recommendation to adopt priorities? Is it a recommendation to um, to the council to instruct the manager to get working on these? Um, where where do we foresee what what do we foresee that motion being at this point in time, knowing that that can obviously change in terms of not not what's in the motion, but is it a recommendation to adopt a priority or is it something to instruct the town manager? Is it something else completely that I don't think of that that would, I think, be helpful for us to discuss or have keep in mind as we continue this conversation? So thoughts on that. Evan. I'm a little uncomfortable with it being sort of an order or a directive to the town manager. I feel like that sort of, um, it's basically saying, we want you to tell planning staff that these are the things they have to write. And I, I'm a little uncomfortable with that feeling a little overstepping. At the same time, I feel like just saying, here are our priorities is a little vague, blander than I'm hoping for. Um, so I'm wondering if it could be free. I haven't thought this through because I hadn't actually thought about this until this meeting um, as sort of a, a request of planning staff that they, you know, investigate these, you know, six issues or something like that, or, or a request that they prioritize. So it's, it's clear that we're not just saying these are our priorities because we are asking planning department to do something, but I don't want it to be us directing planning department to do something that, I, that difference is sort of subtle, but I do think it's important between us saying planning department do this and us saying, hey, here's what we would like to see you working on. One thing I want to say just while I have the floor um, as you're kind of planning the next meeting, one question I would ask Chris and Rob, so you can just give them a heads up, is of the 10 things on this council list, on the however many things on their list, and then planning board, there's, they're so broad that it's, it's sort of hard, but on those, which of these could you get a new or amended zoning bylaw to the planning board by January 1. And I know that sounds like a really aggressive timeline. I think Dave's point of this is a moment where it's time to be bold and aggressive and not drag our heels. And also, again, that some of these, we already know what to do. Some of these, there have already been drafts of these written that have just failed in town meeting that I'm sure could be revived with a new audience. Um, some of these are probably ready to go now. And it would just be nice to know, not just like which of these could be done sooner, but even just putting somewhat of a timeline on this of like, which of these could you have in front of the planning board by January 1? Um, just to set, because I want us to make a, a point that we are, we're not just like talking, we are actually looking for stuff to get done in the next year and not just like one thing. Uh, Dave. So yeah, um... I guess what I was thinking, Mandy, you know, kind of following up on what Evan said and his feelings about, you know, how directive to be to staff. I mean, you know, I, I think I would be very happy to set up a meeting with Rob and Chris where you and I could meet with them and and kind of convey some of this to them if, if that would work for you. Um, and, and we could really, you know, bring a, a kind of the, the, the spirit of this meeting into this, you know, kind of uh, like what Evan said about impact, timeline, the COVID lens, you know, looking at kind of three months, six months, one year, and, and then, you know, having Chris and, and Rob respond to that maybe at your next meeting um, to have something back to you. And I don't want to promise two weeks from now, but get something back to you that you could then, um, have some response to and say, yeah, that's, that's what we, that's what we're looking for. Um, you know, this is a very high priority for staff. I know it's a high priority for Paul. It's a high priority for me. Rob and Chris are poised. So I agree. Let's, let's get going. Thank you, Dave. Shalini. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like this whole process started because um, the planning staff asked us to find out what our priorities was. So they're inviting us to work with them. So I don't think we are ordering anybody. And also just the idea that we 
well, now, now that we have collected this information, going back to them and saying, okay, this is what we've gathered from the planning board, from, uh, from the council and, you know, getting that back and forth feedback. And then based on the timing, impact, cost, we start working on um, things. So I think we've got a plan. Um, I will work with Dave to see when best we can get Rob and Chris in here on their schedule um, to continue this conversation, whether it be the next meeting or the meeting after, we'll, we'll have to work with them um, to do that. Um, with that, I think we are ready to move on to the next item on our agenda. And we are again, still on time. You guys are doing great. <laughs> which is comprehensive housing policy. So I think I need to give a little bit of an introduction to this. Um, what I was tasked with doing for this meeting was taking our discussion from the last meeting and starting to put it into a format or document that might we might be able to see something and start working on as a housing policy. So I attempted to do that. Um, I looked at a number of samples and examples and all. And so what you've got in front of you is a draft, obviously, that starts with an introduction um, and then sets forth the goals that we discussed last time, those, those five things, a couple of things were combined, um, but that housing policy goals are sort of the bulk of what we discussed last time to say, let's start putting this into a policy. And then the next section, the objective strategies and measurables are what we discussed would sort of flush out those goals of, we've got a goal, now what, what does that goal mean? And how are we going to get there? And how are we gonna measure that we got there? Um, and you'll see in there what I worked on in terms of better language in terms of you know sort of more put together language was the the wording of the goals and in some sense some of the objective and then there's always a little description under the objective um, and some of that description the strategy strategy section how i came up with those are from our discussion um, when things might have been mentioned i tried to put them into the right section the right goal um, and also and this, the strategies and measurables came from our discussion. It came from the draft affordable housing trust priorities, housing, affordable housing priorities document that was originally presented to us last year. So I tried to pull as much of that language out as possible and stick that into this document where appropriate. Um, and also from the document we were just looking at, the compiled list of zoning priorities from the council, um, a lot of times those zoning priority, priorities, not all of them were zoning, first of all, related, not all of them related to zoning bylaws, but many things in there touched on housing. And so if, it, if I thought it touched on housing or a goal we talked about with housing, I tried to throw it into the strategy or the measurable section, depending on what I thought was best. So those things, those sections are just right now sort of a dump of ideas. They're not, they're not organized, they're not, you know, anything we've even talked about in terms of what might go in there. It's just right now sort of collecting things that have been mentioned. Um, so I, I think what we should talk about in the next 30 minutes or so is thoughts on this, you know, some sense, this document and its style, but more importantly, the goals and then what our next steps with those goals are, are they to send the goals out to people for feedback or do we wanna flesh out more of this document in terms of objectives and strategies before we send it out to feedback? But if we're going to do feedback now, sooner rather than later, who we send it to. So that I hope frames our discussion for the next half hour or so. Um, and if people want me to put this up, I can put this up on the, on the screen, but I think we're not quite ready to be talking about specifics. So, so I'm not sure we're wordsmithing enough to have this up on the screen, but I'm happy to do it if people want. Um, so thoughts.
Evan. So uh, first of all, thank you uh, for putting this together. Um, this is a lot of work, especially paired with all the work you did for the um, zoning priorities list. I can't imagine how many times you've had to read through that 10 page list of council zoning priorities. Um, structurally, I wanted to say that I really like how we lay this, how you laid this out. Um, I like how you uh, identified the goals. Um, the, one, the one thing I would say in just reading through on um, the sections, and I know obviously the like strategies and all that are, you know, literally just copy and pasted a lot of times from that other document. Um, but I do think we need to make sure um, if I'm looking at bullet two, uh, promote a diversity of housing types and access to homes at all income levels, and bullet three, promote creation of housing throughout all neighborhoods to support the inclusion of all communities. Um, we just have to make sure that people understand the difference between those is, and I would actually say, maybe switch those, the order of those, because one is really about creating housing, just like literally production, and the other is about then ensuring that that production represents a diverse housing stock, that it's not a monolithic production. At least that's how I interpreted it. Um, I think the stuff, the content that was put under the promote creation of housing, all is like very similar to the promote diversity of housing and it kind of muddies the water between the two. Um, and so I think we just have to make sure with those two bullets that we're very clear in what they're, how they're different. Because um, I think even some of the strategies are the same, like they're literally copy and pasted the same. And it's probably you were looking, you were going, yeah, which one does this belong to? But I think what that actually showed me is that we need to have a firm understanding of what distinguishes these so that it's clear what a bullet goes to. Um, so I think that's my first comment is just making sure that we, we can differentiate those bullets before we send this out. So people aren't coming back and saying, I don't get the difference between bullets two and three. They seem to both be about the same thing because in, in my mind, they're very different things. Um, making, uh, and then there was something else I was going to say. Oh, and then I was going to say, I think, uh, the conversation we need to have just at some point is how specific we want to get in this. Um, that's probably not a, a conversation we need to have now. Um, but obviously some of these things are very broad and then we had some very specific like policy solutions in there. Um, and we have to think about, I think, I guess, where on that range of like super broad and like theoretical to like an actual policy proposal where we want the strategies. I like the idea of having strategies, but where do we want them to fall? Because if you get too broad, it's like they're meaningless, right? It's like promote housing that's affordable. And it's like, that doesn't mean anything. But on the other hand, if you get too specific, you're basically getting into sometimes like zoning debates about a particular zoning bylaw that I don't think we ever envisioned this policy would be. And I think would also make it very hard to get what I hope will be a unanimous adoption by the council. Um, as, and then as far as, as process goes, you know, the goals I think are broad enough that they're not, it, they don't do us too much value to start sending the goals out. I think we probably want to refine the document just a little bit more before we send it out. Thank you, Evan. Shalini. Yeah, just, and acknowledge tremendous work put in here and I, I love the way it's organized uh, but again I my question I think it's what Evan was saying about how specific especially when it comes down to strategies I think I want to see that in and especially because that's what dictates the measurables in but what is a process for arriving at those strategies like why this and not something else and yeah I'm not clear about that, how we're coming up with the strategies and yeah, the process for that. So we're not sure we have one yet, which is why we need to talk <laughs> about the process. Right now, like I said, that, that strategy section That's, is, uh, is mm -hmm. just a compilation of things from many different Right, areas. right. Mm. So, so Shalini, I guess my question to you would be based on what Evan has said in my, my original question, at what point do you think we need to start pushing this out for feedback before or after we've refined? I mean, Evan seemed to fall on the refine the goals, objectives, and blurb more, and maybe a little more strategy refinement before sending it out. Um, and, and the question to the rest of the committee is, 
where do they where does everyone stand on when we send this out in terms of refinement i don't know <laughs> Um, Steve. So kudos to really getting this conversation going by all the work you've done. So it, you know, it's not ready for prime. It's not ready for distribution yet because it's really all of the spaghetti on the wall. And so some things, so what I would not want to get to is a point where we have somebody's, a particular counselor's idea on the list, a draft list that's distributed, and then that goes off for some reason. But there, you know, there are some things that, and then, you know, I didn't, because we weren't really getting into the details of the zoning discussion, but there are some of the counselor ideas that I think actually would be anti-housing that would actually prevent housing from happening. So, I, I think that we need to vet it, you know, quite a bit actually before we distribute it. That, that's my feeling. But um, I think that the work that you've done to put it all out is amazing. Oh yeah, the other thing is in terms of, the, so they, there are the, and I, I can't have both that up and the Zoom screen. So I've taken that off my primary. I, I can, but I, I don't. But we have the objectives, which are like the five major, those are called the objectives, right? The goals. The goals. Yeah, so those would not necessarily be the order that I would, and I know that they're not a priority order, and everyone always says that, they're not number, they're not, but, but they always are, like what's our number one priority? So I think climate resiliency is a really important one, but I actually think the creation of um, the, I actually think some of the lower bullets in a way are more are, are more important. Not that we shouldn't be building climate resilient housing, but I think that looking at where we build hmm, is probably the critical issue and what types of housing we build to me is a critical issue. And then also what we do with existing housing stock. That was just rambling. Nope, nope. I'm I'm hearing a lot of good things. Um, what I'm hearing is we need to do more with this before we send it out for comment. Um, so we won't. We'll stay away at this point from who we would get those comments from until it's a bit better, um, not just organized, but also vetted in terms of not necessarily just a full list of everything people have mentioned in terms of anything, it would be a little more um, cut back. Um, I'm also hearing at this point that goals two and three probably need reworked in wording. Um, and that I, I can tell you, I think the order is just the order I had them in my notes, <laughs> which means it's the order we talked about randomly, um, that we might want to reorder these um, to start with so that they're listed in a different order. Um, so those are the things I'm hearing right now. I think some of that we might be able to discuss now so that a second draft can come back um, in terms of a better order um, wording. We can not necessarily wordsmith now, but but we can talk a little bit more about two and three. I must say, as, as Evan said, as I was doing it, um, I was like, well, some of this fits into both. And so, yeah, we, we, we probably need to better word those um, to make clearer what the distinction between the two are. Um, the objectives are that hope. So, um, you know, maybe we can focus on for the rest of this meeting, uh, the objectives, the description under the objectives and the order of the goals, first of all. Um, so Shalini and then Evan. I was thinking that it, we've hired so many consultants in the past, like we have that housing production um, report. I think there are two of them out there. And, I, and then we, uh, I've noticed you've already taken the suggestions from, the, from uh, Mr. Hornick's uh, suggestions to us. You've already incorporated those. But I wonder if it would make sense to go through, and we can divide this up, and that could be some of the homework that we do, the 
each of us can pick up a different report or something and go through the strategies that the consultants have suggested and uh, maybe highlight those over here that are already here and those could be used. And then also the master plan also has certain um, priorities and strategies, I think, in that. So we could just draw from those in, instead of uh, creating a new sort of. Great. Um, thank you, Shalini, for that suggestion. And Evan. So um, with regard to the, the goals and the order, I, I agree it's easy to say, uh, you know, oh, there, this is no particular order, but everyone assumes there's an order. And so I always think you have to justify the order and it doesn't have to be prioritized. Um, but to some extent, it seems to me that it's almost like a, we want you to create housing. That housing should be a diversity of types. It needs to be safe and secure. It needs to be sustainable and we should use municipal resources to do it. That's not necessarily in priority order. That's just literally like, it's almost like the, the building blocks, right? Like you can't talk about diversity of housing stock unless you're actually creating it, right? You can't talk about uh, sustainability of housing stock unless you're actually creating it, right? Um, so I just wanted to offer that as one potential reordering um, that the first thing should always be creation of housing because none of this matters if we're not creating housing. Although we do talk about sort of rehabilitating, renovating and stuff like that. Um, but even that, that's still sort of new growth in, in some ways. Um, I guess uh, I'm fine going through, you suggest, my comment went up before you suggested that we focus just on the um, goals and objectives. Um, but I really did want to look at, at just having a conversation at some point, again, it doesn't have to be today about how specific we want the strategies to be. And I guess sort of one of the first steps to that in my mind was much what, like you did, I think what you did for the um, zoning list that we just looked at actually works really well for the strategies, which is see where there's common themes and then see how there can be sort of an agreeable way to frame that theme. And so, you know, like I was looking at um, the seventh bullet under climate, ensure that any new development is, uh, nope, that's not the one I was looking at. Um, oh, require, oh yeah, no, that, that was, ensure that any new development is close to services and public transit in downtown is sort of like a, when you say ensure that any new development is close to services and down, it makes it sound like no, nothing that's not close to services or nothing that's not downtown can be developed, right? But that could easily be just encourage and promote development that's close to services. And that's like a really agreeable thing. And so at some point it seems like it makes sense to make these not super specific in my mind and just go through and say, what are sort of the general messages of each? Because then those will inform actual policy um, later. And so, you know, I like the words of always encourage, promote, incentivize, and then make what we're incentivizing somewhat specific. But that then sends a message because you have something in the introduction somewhere about how this policy will be used to guide the work of the committees and town planning staff. And so, it's sort of almost justification for what they're doing. But I'm also happy to go through objectives and the little summaries. So I, I was thinking this, the objectives and summaries, at least for now, simply because we have about 15 more minutes left, 15 to 20 more minutes left to discuss. And I think the strategies might take a little bit longer and, and all. Um, so if everyone's okay with, you know, we'll, we'll reword the goals. Um, is let me just first ask Evan's order of the goals. Is that um, sounds like a decent order for everyone for moving forward? I'm seeing a thumbs up from Steve. Um, Shalini has turned off her video, but um, is that a thumbs up Shalini? <laughs> yes, it is. So we'll, we'll go with that order in the next draft. Um, but but we'll we'll do the order in this draft because that's the order we've got right now. Um, and so the first the first bullet point in this draft is, um, and and for this I'm actually going to share my screen um, because on the video this will help people. They won't have to pull up a different document. 
um, I'm not going to modify on this document, but we'll just share the screen here. Um, and so the first one we were looking at, you can see I left yellow because I wasn't sure where to go on from here on the little description, um, mainly because I didn't have a cheat sheet from some other town that had this. <laughs> so, um, it, but, but the objective on this one was to ensure that new and rehabilitated housing is constructed to address climate action, including sustainability and resiliency of housing and residents. Um, thoughts on whether that is inclusive enough of this goal? Um, and, and then there's obviously the description underneath that probably needs a bit of work. Evan. So I guess my, my suggestion on this would just be, it says address climate action, including sustainability and resiliency of housing and residents. I would say um, get rid of the including because sustainability doesn't always mean climate, right? Like sometimes there's sustainability things that aren't necessary. You could probably circle everything back to climate in the end, but it's different. Um, and then to be honest, when I first read this, I had no idea what resiliency of housing and residents meant, especially resiliency of residents. And then as I started to read through strategies, I saw things like create standards, uh, literally it's on the screen right now, create standards for livability, requirements for fresh air, air circulation. And I started to wonder if that was meant with resiliency of residents, which is really more about like environmental health. So I'm wondering if it should just be ensure that new re rehabilitated housing is constructed to address climate action, sustainability, and environmental health. Other thoughts? I think it could simply say address sustainability and resiliency. I mean, in other words, I think that because this is a housing document, we know that it's referring to housing and we, so at this point, we know that the climate change is the critical issue. So, so I think, that, that, yeah. Sorry, go Steve. Yeah, but then, um, so for me, this means like building codes. It means where we, how we zone land, like where we, we, where we allow people to build. Um, so, so, and whether or not we live in single family houses or in multifamily houses. So I think that, you know, if you ask anyone what sustainability and resiliency means, you're gonna get a whole lot of different answers. But for me, it means living compactly as possible out of areas that are likely to be susceptible to the effects of climate change and with within housing that is, um, built to be flexible within wild swings in, and actually I literally mean that, flexible and um, adjustable. I mean, within wild swings in weather. So, so not, I, dependent, not dependent on fossil fuels would be another way of saying that. What I was gonna say with resiliency is, you know, um, if you think about coastal living, which we are not yeah. really coastal living, they are doing building codes where the houses now have to be on stilts, essentially. Yeah. That's resiliency. Yeah. Um, to, to respond to climate change and make sure the buildings as the oceans rise or as the weather gets warmer or, you know, you know, drought, less water, that the buildings will still be livable and, you know, and, and aren't going to be as affected as they would be if they were built prior. So, you know, maybe leave resiliency in, but I do like Evan's wording of um, yeah. environmental health too. Um, Whenever Evan, you see those buildings on stilts, the first question you should ask is why the hell are they allowing people to build there? 
Evan. I liked my idea of environmental health too. That said, that seems like actually it fits more in the goal about safe and secure housing. Mm. So I'm wondering if really we just keep this objective strictly to uh, climate action and resiliency and just say this is about housing that will reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and housing that will be able to withstand the consequences of our past reliance on fossil fuels and sort of leave it at that, not try to include things like access to fresh air, because really that's sort of about safe and secure housing that comes later. Okay, um, Steve? Yeah, and I completely agree, but I also think that, um, so I'm, I'm trying to think, what are the susceptibilities in Amherst? So we, we get hurricanes that have been dissipated as they come up through the Connecticut River Valley. We get tornadoes, no one, you know, it's hard to build for that. We don't have that many areas that flood, at least not that aren't protected. So really our, I mean, we do have vulnerabilities, but I think most of it, it has to do with power loss, trees coming down on power lines. And so I think that in a, in a weird way, I think that, and I know we're not getting down in the details, but in a weird way, planning for loss of power, you know, for 10 days or more, I think is kind of a critical, you know, part of this. So that's actually where I like the balconies and the green space, but, but I, I think it makes it too complicated. There's also the planning for hotter summers because New England has generally not planned for many 90 degree days. Um, and, and colder winters, yeah. Sometimes on the same day. So I, I welcome any other suggestions as we move to a second draft of this. Feel free to send them to me um, on this one, especially as we try to expand the little blurb under the objective before we get to strategies. I think we're gonna move on to the next one. Um, which I think only had one objective, yeah. Um, promote diversity of housing types and access to homes at all income levels. So this is the non-production one. This is the what does housing look like in Amherst, but not um, what does it look like and how costly is it, but not actually producing it um, is one way I was trying to look at it. So thoughts, um, Evan and then Steve. So um, first, I, I actually wasn't done on the climate action thing. Oh, Just sorry, thing. you can I, go back. Don't scroll back up or anything. The only thing I wanted to add is that the little summary below, we should probably reference the council's adopted climate action goals and probably also reference the climate action plan that should be forthcoming. I don't know if it'll be adopted before this, but you, you know, at it some probably it, will be. it probably will be and so it should at least be included here um because i think that the little summary paragraph that you heard of had the yellow ending to some extent it just it, it really just needs to say that we want to promote cre creation and rehabilitation of housing that allows us to meet our climate our adopted climate action goals and aligns with our climate action plan and kind of what we did i, I really liked what um gol did with uh the town manager goals of sort of trying to tie them all back to an action of the council. And um, I think for this one, we do. Um, for this for this objective, um, uh, I like um, promote the creation of housing in a variety of types to create housing that will appeal to many residents at all stages of life. Um, I, I don't, I don't understand to end the appearance of monolithic construction of one bedroom units in town. I, uh, would like to see that removed. Um, I think it feeds into a, a an unfortunate narrative about development here, especially because I, I've been driving around and all of the new development I've been seeing down in South Amherst and on Henry Road has been single family homes. So I would, you know, argue that we've had more development of single family homes in the past couple of years than of one bedroom units. Um, so I, I'd like to, st I'd like to strike that. And then, uh, you know, not to get nitpicky, but I often am. Um, create housing that will appeal. The word appeal just sort of 
rubs me the wrong way there because I, I don't think it's that will appeal to many residents. I think it's that's accessible to many residents at all stages of life and incomes because we're looking for sort of generational and racial and socioeconomic diversity. But it's not like we need to appeal to seniors. It's just it needs to literally be accessible fit, you know, often financially to seniors. Okay, thank you, Evan. Um, Steve. Yeah, so the number, one of the number one ways, so housing becomes unaffordable when the demand exceeds the supply. So the, one of the ways of addressing affordability with a small <laughs> is to increase the supply. There's no better way of increasing supply than multi-story buildings. So single family housing will never get us there. Accelerate, um, accessory dwelling units will never get us there. So, um, but this is not the, the creation of housing, new housing. Yeah, so that's my comment there that in some ways we want, I don't think we even need to have single family houses here because I'm not sure that that needs encouragement, nor do I think that makes any sense in a housing policy guideline. But yeah, but a lot of this I like need of housing affordable to residents in many stages of life, sizes of families, and definitions of families, different types of families. Yeah, I don't under, I don't understand the monolithic one bedroom because I'm not even sure where those are. I'm not sure that we have any monolithic one bedroom housing. And I also don't think we've had a boom. I think we've had buildings built, but those are the first buildings built in many, many decades. So. I'm not sure we're quite at the boom stage. I think the boom comment came from the housing trusts draft yeah. document. Yeah. Either that or the master plan. Yeah. And maybe it was the master plan that that first sentence came from. So if the that master plan, plan, that'd be even more surprising because the master plan was but prior to the- It might have been the, the affordable housing trusts document yeah. that I pulled that yeah. first sentence from, but I, I will relook at that first sentence. Maybe uptick in multifamily housing or multi, yeah. Okay. That's how we all have different lenses, isn't it? Yep. No, I, I, will, I will revisit that sentence um, and I'll, um, I think Evan is, next well i was just building on that just gonna say just strike that sentence yeah. it, it doesn't really it's not necessary but i think amherst is in need of housing affordable to residents at many different stages of life and sizes of family and then listing all of the different types uh you know i think that's what's important um but yeah this this idea of one bedroom units in that first sentence and in, in the objective i think we should just get rid of okay we ready to move on actually we're we're almost, we got about five more minutes before we have to move on, I think. So let's see if we can do one more. And this is the creation one. Evan. So this is where I think we need to really make sure we're distinguishing between the two. And that's where, and so this is where I would say, um, the variety, it says variety of housing, I think gets a diversity of housing stock. And that's where it starts to muddy the waters. And so we should just get rid of that. And same thing so that neighborhoods become integrated in all areas, including, I think all of that has to do with that former goal. To me, this is at least how I initially read this. And if people on the committee disagree, please tell me as we all, we need policies that make sure we have a diverse housing stock, but we also need policies that literally make sure that we have enough housing. And so I always saw this as the first step, which is let's create housing and what are our strategies to just literally make sure that housing is being created. And then also the next, the other goal that we just looked at was making sure that the housing it is created is diverse, that it has a, a different types. And so to me, this should be something that like, um, this really needs to reference what I think Steve said earlier, which is the supply and demand problem that Amherst has and needs to go, it, it needs to be something about um, promotion of promote, like creation of housing to meet the Amherst housing demand or something even just as simple as that. And then I think that the little paragraph really needs to focus on um, the fact that right now our supply is inadequate against our 
demand. And I think it could pull from, you know, Shalini referenced um, the different studies that's been done. I think that this is a place where we could really pull from the housing market study, which looked at the demand, which looked at vacancy rates and talked about how they're unsustainably low in our community. To me, all of that is what informs this goal. At least that's how I interpreted it was, this isn't about, this is about making sure across the entire town, we're seeing housing being produced and we're implementing strategies to make sure that housing is being produced so that it can better meet our demand and help lift some of the burdens um, that are there. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a comment here. I, I think maybe the promote integrated communities is then a secondary objective of the prior goal um, because the integrated communities is this this particular one is not necessarily re related to it, it's related to the creation of housing but it's more related to we don't want single family homes all in this part of town and apartments all in this part of town and all of those apartments are affordable units only we want neighborhoods that have all price points throughout we don't want these monolithic neighborhoods where there's only one thing here and there's only one thing there. Um, I know Dorothy's talked about this a lot as a counselor in terms of you don't want to, you know, if you look at where our, the SRO is going on Northampton Road, it's we don't want a neighborhood of just SROs. We want those SROs integrated into other neighborhoods and stuff like that. And I thought, and as I was drafting this, that's sort of what this sub goal was, was that mixed, but that doesn't really relate to creation. It relates more to the prior goal. Um, yeah. And the creation one, so I think we have to redraft this one then maybe, the expand affordable home ownership options was more of a creation one, but, but maybe we just need to rewrite the whole thing as to one, one, one goal, not multiple sub goals under this one, and that goal is create housing, build housing, um, and the sub goals more belong in the prior goal. Um, so I'm getting a thumbs up from Evan on that one and from Steve. So I will work on that and to sort of rejigger those two to make that clear. We'll obviously be continuing on in this, this, this discussion and working through this at many of our meetings coming forward. So this is not the end of the discussion. I'm going to stop the share right now. Um, and at this point, We'll pause the discussion. We will come back to it next time. Um, we have on our agenda, no action items. We have minutes from the last meeting, September 15, 2020. Are there any requested changes to those minutes? Seeing none, I will make a motion to adopt the September 15, 2020 minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Evan seconds. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we will take a vote. We're going to, again, just for the fun of it, go in reverse, reverse alphabetical order. So we're starting with Steve. Yes. And then Evan. Yes. Mandy is a yes. And Shalini. Aye. That is a four to zero vote adopted. Are there any announcements? There are no announcements. I don't, I do not have any. Um, next agenda preview uh, will be if we can, if Rob and Chris are available and they can do it, we will put zoning bylaw priorities on it. Um, comprehensive housing policy will be on the agenda going forward. Um, and I will talk with Shalini and Dave about the the item we talked about earlier on um, term limits or reappointment policy for the council um, as to whether that should be on the next agenda or maybe two agendas from now. Um, anything else in terms of thinking about agendas? At this point, I don't see anything else coming forward. Um, from the council, as far as I know. So this is what our meetings will look like pretty much every meeting um, until we get through them um, or until we have a referral for some other bylaw change. Oh, um, I don't think it'll be next meeting. Um, it won't be next meeting, but I sent out an email 
um, mark your calendars for, I think it was November 4th, 8 p.m. for um, a joint planning. We will be joining the planning board in the middle of their meeting um, for a hearing on as yet unknown potential changes to zoning article 14. Um, we're trying to get it planned now, even if we don't know what they look like. Um, we've heard planning staff might want some changes to that um, so that it, the timeline fits to get those changes adopted and effective prior to the actual expiration and sunset of zoning article 14 in case the, I think the desire is to also extend the, the application of that zoning bylaw. So mark your calendars for November 4th for the joint hearing. Um, I don't know whether we'll have language. I don't think we'll have the language as of this coming Monday's meeting, although it will be on Monday's council meeting. Um, the goal is to allow that a direct referral to when the language is ready to us and planning board for the purposes of holding hearings and recommendations. So it's a tight timeline um, since we don't have the language yet, but mark your calendar for that. That is one zoning thing I see coming. Um, Beyond that, I don't have any items anticipated, not anticipated 48 hours in advance. Does anyone else? Seeing none. Randy, uh, is, is, it, is it possible for us to stay on for a minute just to exchange calendar to see when we can connect with Rob and Chris? Yes, I can stay on for that. Yeah, thanks. Um, so seeing nothing else, I will adjourn this meeting at 3.58 p.m. Thank you all and thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you.